This is uh, Yudrun, Open Yudrun from Manakshan Gatsel in Oakland, California. Hope your day is going well. Uh, why don't you pop up and um, say hi if you're here uh, listening to me and talk, interacting with me. And then when you do that, a little box pops up on my screen I've learned on my desktop and shows me your comments. It all goes according to plan. Um, a couple of people were, three people already liked this video without even having me done it yet, having had to have me done it yet. So um, I know there's some enthusiasm about this topic anyway. See somebody there. Pop on up and say hi, somebody. Up oh, two people. Wonderful. I'm just waiting for a quorum for today's very special topic. Hey, Rob. Wonderful to see you, sort of, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Well, today's topic is a beautiful one. David Scharf. Wow. Hi. Well, you're very familiar with this subject, I'm sure, or the subject of our um, connection today. So, um, here's how I got here. We've been going through the various things. Good to see you. Um, we've been going through the various things that um, help us turn our minds to the Dharma. There isn't really a good phrase for that in English. Like, what would we say? Change our minds, I guess. Transform our minds and really get to the um, deeper truths. Dharma means truth, among other things. And um, I ran into a kind of um, issue with um, rebirth, because for me and, and many other um, traditional Buddhists, particularly people from societies in which Buddhism is um, indigenous, um, reincarnation and rebirth are uh, um, given. You know, it's not, and uh, we have experiences that go along with that, and whether it's our mind making up those experiences, bah humbug, or whether it's actual experiences, you know, each of us can only decide for ourselves. So just so you know, I'm, I'm doing, as we're getting settled in here, I'm doing a little ad for I decided along those lines to do a um, study group on the Western literature on reincarnation. There's a whole body of scientific literature of um, interviewing people who remember past lives. Hey there, Heart Sutra. And um, very vividly following up on it and going to the, the place that they said they were, looking for people with that name and so forth. And uh, of course, a lot of that is un, unpursuable. But um, on Thursday, we're going to look at that scientific literature, which largely came out of the University of Virginia, but other places as well. And together, collaboratively, not me as teacher, we're going to um, read some of this kind of source material and really look at it under the microscope and see if it, it holds up. Um, and so we're going to have one and a half hours a week meeting together for six weeks. First week, we're going to divide up the materials. Some of them are long books and some are like articles or even a video. And um, people will volunteer to take that uh, book or chapter or whatever and do a report on it to us because we quickly figured out that in a, a short period of time each of us can't read like five ten books it's not going to happen so this is our adventure in the next six weeks and while we're doing that i kind of jump forward to the next chapter in the words of my perfect teacher one of the core texts my my transcription software always wants to write cortex of course <laughs> one of the most important texts in our tradition when how to do this mind turning around business. And the next chapter is the one place where our stern monk, Patron Pache, um, gives a window, like makes a little promise about the wonderful things that can occur, enlightenment, 
you know, what enlightenment means in like a paragraph. Uh, he's um, very rarely did he address that topic in the whole tome. But I thought it would be a good time since I, I pulled, you know, David, I don't know if you were part of that group, but when I was on the um, Friends and Stripes group on um, Facebook, I pulled a lot of people about what actually turned their mind to the Dharma, what actually changed them to have an interest. I mean, there's all these really hardcore, really great, serious Western practitioners on that group, some Asian also. And they gave a bunch of answers. And one of them was they met some of these great masters who'd come out of Tibet, as I'm sure you did. And um, Rob, you've met great masters who came out of Tibet. And in fact, um, oh yeah, you were part of that, David. I'm just, let me see if I can do this. I think you can drag, you can do it. Look what I can do. Isn't that fancy? Now that I've all hooked up technologically. Yeah, it was a very interesting poll. And I'm going to work with it because I'm working on a book to try to make this relevant for people now. But what the one of the main things was, they met these great lamas. And that's what turned their mind to the Dharma. They, go, they went, wow. You know, and there's this there's this expression from the 60s and 70s, it blew my mind. And they had their mind blown by these beings who were unlike anybody they'd ever met before. And um, in my case, uh, the first one that really blew my mind was Amitar Chinurpache of, of Santa Cruz. And um, later, Lama Pema Dorje Rinpoche and, and Atsum Pelo Rinpoche have come. Um, so I think we're, I've practiced mainly in two sub-lineages of the Nyingma tradition. We're going to go through some of those in order. And today we're going to start with the Dujum Teresar lineage, the lineage of the Dujum demon subduers, with the, an amazing figure, Dujum Lingpa. And Dujum means demon subduer. And I think this is his name given to himself. In the common parlance, he was known as Gili Tulku. And Gili was a family. It doesn't sound like a Tibetan name. much must be a regional dialect thing. Gili was a um, family that supported him financially, and Dujum Lingpa had a very hard life. If you look, my friend, my, I'll say Vaja's sister, <laughs> who I did um, three-year retreat with, she did had done one before, and she came into ours um, and did two years of ours also. Um, Chinni Droma wrote the, um, translated this wonderful um, autobiography actually two autobiographies in here, by Dujum Lingpa. And um, she points out that he was impoverished during much of his life. And a lot of families kind of, you know, there was there were expectations, like they come see come stay at their house and do all these ceremonies and stuff. And the expectation that culture was and you give, they'd be given offerings. And then they, he'd, they'd be, he'd be stiffed <laughs> again and again, you know. And... Um, Anyway, he was not, a, what's really marvelous about his story, you'll read the phantasmagoria of his story in, the, in his book, but what's amazing to me is that he was nobody from Nowheresville. He did construct, you're supposed to be from a good family in order to be a Buddhist teacher in that culture, good Dharma family. So at the beginning of his autobiography, he constructs a lineage that, it takes him back to the great masters of the past. Um, but I don't think his family was anything in, in that generation, it was anything famous, rich, or anything like that. And he he was uh, someone who was, um, he started as, as a baby. He remembers receiving messages from the Dakinis, or the um, messengers of the great beyond. <laughs> And um, they taught him how to read, he, he said. He never had any formal education. And um, that's what he said. we got to believe him, right? And and he had all these visionary experiences. So the, he did do a little bit of Nundra, the preliminary practice. Um, 
I see a high unit from some unnamed person. There's a high unit. Oh, no, it's Bob Rob up there. Okay. Okay, so we got, I think I've identified everybody here. So. He was guided by inner voices. And so, in a way, he wandered from place to place, guided by spiritual messages that he received. He did do a little bit of training, like a month of Nundra. <laughs> I mean, it's, it says right in there, you know, in the, for the with the Lama in the Wang Chen Mintu tradition, another Teresa tradition, another Terma tradition. But mostly, um, he was a spiritual seeker, and when he had questions, teachers, great beings from the past, um, and Dakinis and so forth would come to him and answer them. Sometimes singing songs and really wild. And so I want us, I think what we'll do with our meditation this hour, traditionally they break things up according to body, speech, and mind. And I think we, let's, let's meditate on Dujan Lingpa's body. So I'm going to show you a little film I made, <laughs> a couple minutes long with images of sculptures and tankas and scroll paintings of Dujan Lingpa. Um, all in the, with the characteristics that he specified, there's a, a sadhana or a practice text. It's actually in one of the trauma volumes, for you, those of you who are Dharma geeks. And um, that is, has him described as he is pictured. And we have one, you'll see one wooden statue there that I believe was carved to his specifications in his lifetime. And what's really interesting about it, it's the one at the end, um, is that uh, when Tuklu Teglu came, Teglo came by from Guluk um, a number of years ago and gave all the empowerments and transmissions from this Dujum Linkless, 20 volumes of collected works. Um, you could see like totally clear as daylight that Dujum Linkless nose was Tukuteglo's nose. Tukuteglo was a grandson or great-grandson? Maybe great-grandson of um, Dujum Linkpa. He's still alive. Um, I mean, it was like it, my mouth was hanging open. It was so amazing. So I believe that this statue you'll see was the um, really carved from life. And so this is a real person. And he was in a mountainous area of, of Tibet called Goluk. It's an area sort of like Australia. You're going to wonder, why am I saying Australia? Well, you know how Australia was a penal colony? Golok was a penal colony. People were exiled there who were scoundrels. <laughs> and so the ancestors of a lot of people in Golok are, are thieves and so forth. That's why I've, thus I have heard. And um, so crime was always rampant in Golok and also incredibly devoted practitioners. The, the Longchen Ningtik tradition was the main Nyingma traditions is rooted there at Dodra Chen Monastery. I've never been. Maybe you've been. Maybe some of you guys have been. David, for example. Um, so that's the setting in which you find him. And he, there was, he sort of established a tradition. It may have been one before, but I can't, I don't, haven't seen any earlier references to it, of Ingolok having these big encampments that surround would grow up around a llama and they were because Golik was nomad, nomadic pastoral society. They would follow Dujim Lingpa um, from place to place and then set up camp around him. So this became a thing with great llamas, um, you know, seasonally or whatever, following when they'd have their animals with them and go from one place to the next. So um, let me just say a little bit about how, how he was uh, sort of uh, was bopping around. He's represented, he, he wanted his representation of himself. is holding a um, purba in his left hand. Purba is like a, a three-sided tent peg, which represents three aspects of emptiness, dharmakaya, sambhogakaya, nirmanakaya. And uh, it's, a, it's like a dagger. 
and in his right hand he's holding a vajra, which also represents emptiness. <laughs> and this left hand posture you'll see him in is um, with the with the purple. I don't have one with me right now. It'd be a little ostentatious to actually wield one. Um, also represents is how Yeshe Sogyal is represented, um, the sort of mother of Tibetan Buddhism. She um, is said to have raised uh, somebody from the dead by um, by pointing her purba, her ritual implement, at him. And um, so there's a reference to Yeshe Sogyal that way. And then up here, the golden vajra is uh, represents Guru Rinpoche, Padmasambhava, and um, Wide open eyes represent a wrathful deity. Um, and we'll say more about that later. And he has his hair up in a top knot, and then he's got a text wound through his head, which was a thing that non-monastic lamas did. He was never a monk. Uh, he had ma many children. Um, they wore their hair long. And dreadlocks and was wound up at top tied with a red thread and had a dharma text tucked in there and i don't know what the official certainly this was considered a kind of um, blessing to have this where the you know, this is a place of honor to have the dharma on your head but it also said that to me visually it says i think he was trying to communicate with this imagery that he didn't ever study you know, he wasn't a Dharma scholar, monk sitting in a monastery, had memorizing lists. He'll even say that, and then I'll read something to you later. He talks about the blessings came to him, you know, and through, and this shows devotion, through devotion to the Dharma. And he was always wearing holy texts on the top of his head because he was a constantly a, a receptacle for Dharma teachings, and he passed them on to us. I'm not going to go into the whole Tertan phenomenon now because that's a whole hour. So those are some of the, you'll see him in, you know, lay people's garb. And this, I'm wearing this scent today in honor of Dujum Lingpa. And all practitioners in Dujum Lingpa's trauma tradition wear a stripy zen like this. Sometimes the lay people also wear a white zen, but this is a, a lay Vajrayana practitioner's um, robe. So he's so he wore a tuba, the traditional robe of the lay people in Golok, and then the Zen. So to me, he looks in the images that will follow that he found he looks like a king. He looks very noble and regal. He looks very masculine. He looks very fierce. And. Um, he looks like he's guided with spiritual messages. He has complete confidence and no doubt. Um, these are some of the things that come up for me as I look at his image. So let's look a little at our little slideshow, and then let's just rest in meditation for a few minutes. And what you can do then is dissolve the image you formed of him into yourself, and then dissolve yourself into radiant light. So make it like a ball of light out of Dijim Lingpa and immerse that ball into you and then dissolve your body into light as well and rest there. Let's try that meditation, see how it goes. All right, let's get started.
So that is the kind of the body aspect of Jujumipa. It's an amazing statue from his seat, Lachuku Teglo and his son uh, reside now. It's the same statue, pictured in many different ways with different backgrounds. Then there's the speech, and 20 volumes, tens of thousands of words spontaneously emerge from him. Some were triggered by the discovery of physical objects in the environment hidden by Gorimpache, and others um, blossomed in his wisdom mind. You can imagine if you're always um, living in a world where you're encountering all kinds of invisible beings, wouldn't be too hard to <laughs> have the uh, materials come forth that would be benefit to others. So here's a song of realization where now let's talk about the speech of Dojum Lingpa. And to represent his speech, we're going to read a song of realization of his. I think I forgot to say, Dujum Lipa just barely came into the 20th century. He passed away in um, 1904. And he was in his 60s. He looks so old in that statue, doesn't he? Which I, I think probably it was, just, I'm looking around, I think it was 67 or so. He was born in 1835 and, and passed away, yeah, 67. In 2000, uh, 1904. I like the, um, when you're a beginner in Buddhism or when you're in a long-term retreat, in our practice tradition, which is, these are two big traditions, which are not strictly separate at all. One is the sort of lineage of scriptural, the scriptural tradition, and that's great scholars and monks, some nuns nowadays, study and become masters of the literature. And then there's um, the lineage of realization. And, um, here's a song of realization. Ah, the whole of samsara and nirvana is groundless and rootless. The Vajra queen is great space. The great emptiness of space is the great mother. All phenomena are apparitions of reality itself and the soul nature. Everything is born from the unborn. The emergence of arising apparitions ceases. Causes and conditions are extinguished right where they are. Thus, the teacher and the teaching, the path and its fruit, in reality itself are devoid of signs and words. The many avenues of method and wisdom appear as a great natural event and natural arising. The space of no object and great openness is limpid, clear, and free of contamination. All displays of the Buddha field, teacher, and retinue are non-existent, but from non-existence they appear as existent. That we praise with great wonder. And again, merge, you know, you can merge those words. <laughs> or Dujum Lingpa's, your image of Dujum Lingpa into yourself. And then relax into a spacious, non-conceptual frame of mind. And if, when the, if and when the concepts arise again, just we can merge again. And then we get a little taste of what Dujum Lingpa's realization may have been.
So in terms of speech or the words of Dujum Lingpa, you can nowadays you can find them a lot of translations and some of them are from of Sochan texts and um, if you're a practitioner who's received um, really received uh, Trekcha teachings or beyond from a authentic wisdom lama and um, then you can ask them whether it's good to read those books but personally uh, it really served me well to not read ahead it's uh, I have a minority opinion <laughs> because the surprise and sort of shock of not knowing what Zhou Chen was really um, allowed me to really be deeply affected when I was introduced to it. So um, I recommend not going and finding all those expensive books and uh, starting sending out tweets about them. And then um, I want to tell a story. David, do you remember Lama Punsuk used to go to Oregon Dorje Den? Um, he was a secretary of Dujum Rinpoche II and, um, in France when Dujum Rinpoche was there, the, re the rebirth of Dujum Rinpoche. And, um, one time I got to spend, he did some wonderful teachings at ODD about the life of all, of the entire lineage, the whole lineage prayer that we do, the Dujum Tirsar. But I got to give him a, a ride which is the best way. Definitely get in the business of giving lamas rides. And so I asked him all sorts of questions and I sat down on my computer and I typed it all out so that I could remember. Here it is. <laughs> and um, his mother was a student. Her mother, his mother's teacher, his mother's lama, Okay, yeah. Then maybe you were at this talk at ODD. Um, I don't know what year it was. It was definitely before 2007. Um, but anyway, he went to a little bit more detail with me because I'm a nosy person who asked a lot of questions. Um, his mother was a student to a lama who was a student of Jujim Lingpas in Nyarong. So um, that's this... This lama, his mother's teacher, was called Nyarang Tuku, whose main practice had been Alonsha Ningtik and Tromachit, so did you link the cycle. He was a scholar, and he went to visit Dujum Lingfa, I think, for the first time with his younger brother. Let's call his younger brother Ed. So they went to have, I don't think his name was Ed, they went to have an audience with Dujum Lingpa, and they go into the room. And Dujum Limpa called out the name of his younger brother and said, Ed, why are you coming here? And he raised, you see, did you see that sword at his belt? He pulled that sword out and he raised it up and said, I'm going to kill you. And Yarong Tuku himself fled. <laughs> Understandable, right? He ran until he couldn't run anymore. And instead, his, his younger brother, Ed, instead of um, running, he made one, you know, full-length prostration uh, in front of Dujum Lingpa and said, I came all this way. If you're going to kill me, I want it. And he put his neck out for him to cut his neck. And um, are we students like that now? I don't think so. Uh, so then eventually Nyarong Tuku realized his brother was not behind him and <laughs> he'd run off, you know, and he came back in and he had um, tea with Dujum Lingpa and his brother. And he, what well, he said of himself, that completely messed up this connection. They both got the same teaching, um, but his brother got some real effect from it and he himself was untouched by it. And, um, Dujum Lingpa told him, Narong Tuku, to go to Nundra, so, which is the general instruction all of us get, right? So the younger brother, Ed, then went into a solitary retreat 
you know, a hole in the ground, basically. And um, the Tuku, Nyaron Tuku, went off to a nice monastery with gilded statues. And then the Nyaron Tuku went to visit his brother three years into his retreat. And his brother looked like a half man, half animal, he said. He didn't remember him anymore. He didn't care about eating or drinking. Um, and Narantuk was very upset, worried about him. He thought he'd gone crazy. There was no human communication. He thought his brain has died. But he couldn't coax Nyar the, his brother out of there. And he went, uh, so he left. And he came back, you know, guiltily, <laughs> three years later, not for three years, to, he thought he was going to be coming to re re retrieve the corpse of his crazy brother who died of starvation, right? And he wanted to take the bones back and, you know, do some ceremony or something. But instead, his brother greets him perfectly fine and says, uh, how have you been? I haven't seen you in a long time. Uh, now here's where it gets a little bit of a stretch for us. He said, um, he would, you know, he didn't have any like pots or pans or anything to cook food with. He didn't have any food sitting around. And so he said, um, he'd look at the sky and he'd say, Dorje, I need fire. And a fire would start. Dorje, I need Momo. <laughs> and Momos would appear. <laughs> Fresh, just cooked. <laughs> Actually, this was nine years into the retreat, so I don't know how that adds up there. We can ask. Uh, I hope Tuku Rinchen comes around again. I hope he's still with us. He wasn't that old. So um, that's the kind of <laughs> practitioner, you know, fearless, devoted practitioners. And he he had thirteen who attained the highest accomplishment of Sochen. And then many, many others who uh, became gained realization. But they weren't like, um, they didn't have a big building, and he didn't have a big trust fund or um, endowment, you know. He was like tent, tent and um, mountain retreat people. So um, I thought I'd tell that story. And... Then we can go to um, a clear mirror, the autobiography, and let's do a meditation on, all these are meditations on Jujum Lengtha's mind, there's no way around it, but uh, here's um, his um, secret, some passages from his secret autobiography, which secret in it seems to mean they classify texts into outer, inner, secret, and supremely secret and the more s secret you get seems to mean the more profound the more reflecting of actual truth oh wow i'm gonna bring that one up there cool rainbow body is this accomplishment and of dissolving the body dissolves completely or partially at the time of after the time of passing and um, sometimes people see rainbow swirling, light swirling around. Sometimes they don't. But it's the epitome of the highest accomplishment. Wonderful. I'd like to see him again, Lama Rinchen. But I assume he's in France. You can help me track him down. Maybe we can... <laughs> I don't know. I'll talk to the ODD people. I don't know why he hasn't been around lately. Maybe just not available. So here's uh, some of... Um, Jun Lingpa's uh, secret autobiography, and I think represents his mind well. And then we can get a little taste. I was going, tying it all together. I was looking. I was looking at Patron Pache's section about enlightenment, which is quite short. And I went to a scholarly book called the Shecha Zhe, the Treasury of Knowledge. And uh, by Jambagong Kongtrul and was looking at the um, Enlightenment section. And um, 
it became so scholastic and dry that I um, punted to Dujum Lingpas. And now we'll get a taste of how it really is from the inside of when you are completely enlightened. Do you want to know? <laughs> so listen to me further, my darling. Throughout this human life, from beginning to end, although I haven't relied upon a human lama, my karmic destiny through previous training awakened, and I arrived effortlessly at the state of an awareness holder. It didn't depend on words or metaphors, yet the treasury of the vast expanse of the nature of reality overflowed. All appearances arose as signs and metaphors. I became aware of the supreme equal purity of cyclic existence and transcendence. All phenomena were purified as naked awareness. I gained virtuosity in the great perfection. Through the wide eyes of sublime insight and wisdom, I saw the truth of the nature of reality. My inner strength ensured that I had no need to sightsee in the realm of the five senses. With monumental power, as an autonomous king, I gained the unassailable state directly within myself. My inner strength ensured that I had no need to pay attention to others' appraisal. All of the supreme qualities of Kuntuzampo, ever excellent, are not concealed. I've reached their indwelling state. I didn't need to depend upon oral teachings and study. I saw the quintessential equality of cyclic existence and enlightenment as nothing apart from myself. My inner strength ensured that I didn't need to adhere to spiritual approaches that make calculations and lists. Within myself I gained great perfection, in which all paths and stages are but one. My inner strength ensured that I didn't need to meditate with clinging, fetters, and tightness. I attained the fusion of the profound innermost essence of the oceanic classes of sutras and great mantra tantras. I didn't need to go out in the world seeking like a beggar. In that way, I gained mastery of the supreme treasury of the expanse and of the bodies and wisdoms of enlightenment. My strength ensures that there exist disciples, fortunate men and women, connected with me through aspirations and karma. Through the momentum of securing their inheritance, the lineage of wisdom mind, they became awareness holders, and that alone. These are qualities far more exalted than others. Thus I spoke. So how are we going to do this meditation on the wisdom line? Let's bring Dijun Lingpa's mind, this mind that sees the world like that, sees his, sees everything, the truth of everything and abides in a kind of wisdom that's not conceptual. And bring it, let's say if we have a ball of light here, bring it and put it in our hearts. And then we are Jujum Lingpa's wisdom mind. It's a little abstract compared to what we've been doing, but let's, let's give it a shot.
Let's imagine ourselves as Ed. Sometime we have to track down his actual name. Not the later Ed, but the early Ed, who went in and um, said, go ahead, kill me. And um, this is a sensitive area because, you know, there have been a lot of ne'er-do-well gurus in this world. This is a really good one, though. Why did he do that? Why did Dujamalipa raise his sword like that? What do you think? These two people, ostensibly, he didn't know them, but he knew this guy's name somehow. And um, why do you think he lifted his sword like that? What goal was he trying to accomplish? Do you have a comment on that? Well, I don't, Dijam Link was pretty fierce and I don't want to like mis, mis uh, represent him and all of his uh, it's very, it's a very, people are very protective of the, his lineage, rightly so. But I would say, you know, in that moment of saying, I came all this way. Go ahead. <laughs> Cut it off. <laughs> if you're going to kill me, kill me. Um, what is that feeling? Well, well, he was really serious about gaining enlightenment, right? Really serious. Willing to lose his life because he had some kind of indwelling faith in this person who, frankly, looked like a homeless person. You know? Crazy person, probably. You know, and no institution had validated him. He had no PhD. He had no political position. He had no family power. Something about him, just hearing about him, rose up faith in people. And so he, in that moment of surrender, something, a deep connection occurred there. And if I think about, if I imagine myself as Dujum Lingpa raising a sword, I don't feel anything but love, really profound love and compassion. Uh, so that's interesting. Any other comments or experiences you've had practicing with Dujum Lingpa and like merging your mind with Dujum Lingpa this, during this hour? All right. Well, I think we're going to um, say goodbye. And next week we're going to do Sarah Condro. We're going to meet Sarah Condro, um, who was an amazing female lama and um, was actually involved with um, Dujum Lingpa's son, um, one of Dujum Lingpa's many sons, um, and was considered... Um, her own mystical revelations are considered um, part of the Dujum tradition. You think you should? People should read Vajrahart. I don't. <laughs> David thinks we people should read Vajrahart. I personally, it's called that, but it's not Neil Grongjun. That's what it's called. Uh, I personally think people should stay away from such texts until, they, until they've been introduced to the nature of their minds. Otherwise, they gain a lot of concepts. But we'll just disagree about that, David. It's okay. Um, I did three-year retreat in Dujum Lipa's tradition, and uh, we personally worked with um, Sherik Dorje uh, uh which is also translated by... Um, the same group that did uh, Vajra Heart. Um, 
I don't know. For me, I need I, I had that fresh experience of being um, of shock, somewhat like throwing yourself under the <laughs> under the sword of Dijimlingpa. Um, at one point, I was able to throw myself <laughs> myself under the sword of a certain lama, and um, it changed me forever. And I'll always be grateful. And I think that if I'd had a whole bunch of ideas, I had little ideas about it from reading the life stories of the great masters, but I didn't have a whole, the whole thing. <laughs> so, all right, guys. Um, if you want to join us for reading some of the scientific literature on reincarnation on Thursday, um, just contact me, Udrin, at uh, mayummountain.net. And, um, hey, Lori, um, we can dedicate merit. By this merit may all obtain omniscience. May it defeat the enemy wrongdoing from the first stormy waves of birth, old age, sickness, and death from the ocean of samsara. May I free all beings. Hey, Hart. Hey, David. It's true that having introduction first is key. Introduction is something, you know, theoretically, everything goes in linear fashion. You do your foundational practices, and then the Lama appears, great Dzogchen master appears, and you introduce the nature of your mind. But it never works in linear. <laughs> Things never go according to playbooks. <laughs> but Nundra does a lot to open up in our rigid structures. That you see how that Tuku, he had to do Nundra. He couldn't, he didn't have the spontaneity and flexibility to see, you know, and fearlessness in that moment. He didn't know who, he, he didn't really get who he that he was encountering. Guru Rinpoche, Yeshe Sogyal, and Kyu Chung Lutzal incarnate. Um, and so he needed to do Nundra, as I needed to do a lot of Nundra. I still probably could use a lot of Nundra. And then his brother probably didn't do Nundra, or at least not a whole Nundra, because he'd already gotten to some place of appreciation. Well, you know the four thoughts that turn the mind? The first is precious human birth, right? Then impermanence and suffering and cyclic existence. Oh gosh, what do we do? Precious human birth, impermanence. You guys, we've already went through them. <laughs> precious human birth, impermanence, karma, suffering and psychic existence, and then karma. The cause and effect of uh, positive and negative actions is absolutely certain. He, he already had, he really had internalized that, and he knew what he was encountering. All right, guys. So I'll see you next week when we will visit with the Wisdom Dakini, um, Sarah Kondra. <laughs>